After the mention of Ahlu Jahannam and their outcome, now the outcome of the Muttaqeen is mentioned. Inna lil Muttaqeena mafaza. Inna indeed lil Muttaqeen for the people of Taqwa. For the people who protected themselves, who were on guard, people who were careful, who saved themselves. Saved themselves from what? From crossing the limits that Allah had set. Saved themselves from what? From the evil of their own soul. So those who were careful and cautious, who truly looked after themselves, and how is it that they looked after themselves? By just eating good and sleeping well and having enough time for play and fun? Who is it that truly looks after himself? The one who is preparing for his akhirah. Because he is protecting himself, not just from cancer or diabetes or weight gain or being socially alone from suffering from poverty. No. He's protecting himself from eternal misery. This is the one who truly takes care of themselves. Inna lil muttaqeen. So those who had taqwa, for them is mafaza. There is mafaz for them. There is success for them. They will be in the place of success. They shall have ultimate success. Now mafaz is the place of foes. And foes is what? To attain something. So they shall be the attainers. They are those who will attain something, who will get something. They're winners. They're successful. فَمَنْ زُحْزِحَ عَنِ النَّارُ وَأُدْخِلَ الْجَنَّةَ فَقَدْ فَاز The one who is saved from hell and is admitted into paradise, then he has gotten something. He has become successful. إِنَّ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ مَفَازًا It is for the people of taqwa that Allah promises mafaz. So what is this place of mafaz, this maqam of foes? It is jannah. The place where there is only success, there is only attainment, meaning there is no loss. There is absolutely no loss in paradise. So what kind of a place is this mafaz, where there is only gaining and gaining? حدائق وأعنابا It is حدائق gardens وأعنابا and grapevines meaning Jannah is a place where there are حدائق and أعناب حدائق is a plural of حديقة what is حديقة? a garden but what kind of a garden? basically حديقة is used for a walled garden walled garden now a walled garden from the outside maybe it doesn't really look that great but when you're inside and you look at your property, your yard, even if it's very small, but when you look at the fence, how do you feel? This is mine. Right? This is mine. Hada'iqa. Walled gardens. Fenced gardens. What does it show? That it will give the people of Jannah a sense of complete ownership, complete control, and freedom. Freedom also. Hada'iqa wa a'naba. And you see a walled garden. What does it mean? It's owned by somebody. Somebody's here to look after it. Somebody cares about it. And any other piece of land somewhere? What do you have? Weeds growing on it, randomness, garbage maybe. Hada'iqa wa a'naba. A'nab, plural of the word inab. And what is inab? Grapes or grapevine. And this is the fruit of Jannah, special fruit of Jannah that is mentioned over and over again in the Qur'an. That this will be in paradise. And this is beloved to many people. It's refreshing, it's sweet, it's juicy. Hada'iqa wa a'naba. This doesn't mean that there is only a'nab. No. Just one sample, one example is given. You see, anytime you go to a garden, just being in a garden, a beautiful garden, just brings you relief. It's very comforting. 
and good food with it? وَكَوَاعِبَ أَتْرَابًا So firstly, what is mentioned? The food. The property and the food. And now what is mentioned? Companionship. In Jannah, beautiful companionship also. Kawa'ib is a plural of the word ka'iba. And ka'iba from the root letters kaf, ain, ba, ka'ab. Ka'ab is basically, if you remember the ayah of wudu, ka'bain. Hmm? That you have to wash your feet up to where? Ka'bain. What are the ka'ab? Ankles. Ka'ba from the same root. What is ka'ba? It's a building. Right? But why is it called ka'ba? Because it is standing out when there was no structure around it. It was the first building. And even now, when the Kaaba is surrounded with huge, tall buildings, what is it that's the center of attention? What is it? Is it the clock tower? I mean, the clock tower, nice, beautiful, impressive. But really, what is it that's the center of attention? It's that small black cube. Isn't it? It's the Kaaba. So Kaab, ankle, and Kaaba, the building. So basically the word gives a meaning of something that is prominent, something that is protruding out. And Kaaba is used for a young, beautiful woman with a prominent chest. Okay? Prominent breasts. And this is a sign, this is a part of a woman's beauty. And if you think about it, this is the reason why women are instructed that when they go, then they shouldn't just be concerned about covering their hair, right? Or covering the neck, but also, وَلْيَضْرِبْنَ بِخُمُرِهِنَّ عَلَى عَلَى جُيُوبِهِنَّ That they should take some of their khimar, their head covering, and put it where? On their chest. Why? Because this is where the beauty is. This is what makes a woman beautiful, attractive. So we must take care of covering this part also. And it's unfortunate that many times we'll wrap our hijab around and here it is, you know, going up and the whole chest is prominent. Sometimes even a niqab is put on, but the chest is prominent. It's left uncovered. So remember, it's not just to be covered with a shirt or with a sweater or with an abaya. It's to be covered with what? With the khimar, with the head covering. So make sure you pay attention to that. When you step outside, make sure you look in the mirror and check. Is my scarf covering my chest properly or not? This is part of wearing proper hijab. So anyway, this is a part of a woman's beauty. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this in the Qur'an. That how the women of paradise will be beautiful in their bodies also. Now, many times young women, they develop negative body image. Right? And what's the reason? Low self-esteem. What is the reason? Because of this reason. Because they feel that they're very small. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives to the people of taqwa, what? Every single thing that they desire. Yani, this is so amazing. Many people find this objectionable. Why is this mentioned in the Qur'an? Well, why do you care about it then? Really? Why should it not be mentioned? This is something that matters to people. This is something that matters to every girl, every woman. She's concerned about it. This is part of what completes her body and makes her more beautiful, more attractive. And there's nothing to be shy about over here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is hayyi. He has haya. Alright? We don't need to have more haya. We need to have the right haya, which is to cover this. Right? And not expose it. Here we are, you know, criticizing why is this mentioned in the Quran. But at the same time, in other contexts, this is highlighted so much. Right? Or people will show it as much as possible. This is our hypocrisy. Really. This is our double standard. So, kawa'ib, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this over here because this is a part of human Desire, this is something that gives woman confidence, and this is something that makes her beautiful, and everything that a human being desires, wishes for, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has granted that to him in Jannah. So even this Allah mentions, kawa'iba atraba. Atrab is a plural of tirb, and tirb is used for 
women of equal age. So what does it mean then? All people in paradise will be of equal age, same age. Hmm? So what does it mean? That everyone will have youthful beauty. No one will feel lesser compared to another on account of age. Because sometimes people feel bad about themselves. You know, I'm growing older. To a certain age, up until a certain age, people feel very happy. They can't wait for their birthday. Alright? But then what happens? There comes a point where they're like, oh my God, I'm actually quite old. Alright? I want to stop growing. So, kawariba atraba. Age deteriorates in this world. But in the hereafter, in Jannah, how will people be? Eternally young. Now when it comes to our bodies, we have many complexes. Why am I so short? Why is my skin like that? Why is my nose like that? Other people have never noticed the shape of your nose. But here you are, you have such a huge complex about the shape of your nose, or the shape of your eyes, or the shape of your brows, or your height, or whatever. What do we see here? In Jannah, kawa'iba atraba, complete, perfect beauty. Remember, it's not youth, you know, young age in this world that makes a person beautiful. It's not even their beautiful body over here that makes them beautiful. Because this body will deteriorate. This age will also deteriorate. What is it that matters? What is it that will bring eternal youth and eternal beauty? It is taqwa. Because inna lil muttaqina mafaza. It's for the muttaqin that they will have this attainment. And part of the success is this level of continuous, endless, perfect beauty also. So yes, while you look after your body and are concerned about it, good. But also take care of your taqwa. Look after that also. Observe that also. Because true beauty, eternal beauty will be in Jannah. And in Jannah, a person will not enter on account of their beautiful body. No. They will enter it on account of their taqwa. وَكَأْسًا دِهَاقًا And a full cup. Ka'san, a cup, that is dihaq, that's full. Remember, ka's is used for a cup of wine. And remember, wine is not your orange juice. It's fancy, it's expensive, right? So ka'san dihaqa. And remember, ka's is not empty. It's not an empty glass of wine. No, it's got drink in it. And dihaq, dal haqaf. Dihaq is that which is full to the brim. Rising up to the mouth. So this can refer to the froth or the, you know, how it's bubbling, whatever. Ka'san dihaqa. But not such that it's overflowing and causing a mess and, you know, ka'san dihaqa. Full to the brim. You see, when you get your favorite drink, how much of it do you want in a cup? How much? Full. Right? You don't want your cup to be half empty. Ka'san dihaqa. There's so much in Jannah. Isn't there? But here, two things are mentioned in particular. And what are they? Firstly, beautiful companionship. And secondly, good food. Isn't it? Beautiful companionship and good food. And this is basic human desire. To have good friends, good companionship, good partner, and also good food. And many people cannot be happy until both of these needs are fulfilled or both of these desires are fulfilled. Now in this life for the attainment of taqwa, what do you have to do? You have to use these two, enjoy these two, but how? How? Within limits. Sometimes I wonder, even when it comes to food, we are told, you can eat this, you cannot eat this. I mean, it's food. You understand? It's just food. Other people eat it too. They don't die. Why are these things haram on us? Like, why? You know, it's not like it's poison. It's not poison. It doesn't kill people. They eat it. But if you observe taqwa, if you want to make it to paradise, then there are some foods you will not eat. Some drinks you will not drink. Why? 
This is the test of life. When it comes to even sexual relations, even over there, there are limits. And people wonder, why is this haram? Why is dating haram? Everybody does it. What's the big deal? Right? What's the big deal? The thing is that these two desires, the desire to eat and the desire for such relations, this is what? It's carnal. It's within us. It's something which is within our human biology. So, if you don't control it, if you don't put a limit on it, it's very, very easy to get distracted. Very easy to lose control. And really, even when it comes to eating halal, when we indulge in israf, we eat extravagantly. Right? We eat this and then we drink that and then we have like a five course meal and we eat because it's all you can eat. Right? Buffet, so eat whatever you can, one serving after another. What's the impact of that? Does it affect your mood? Does it? Does it affect your speech? Yeah? Does it affect your work, your productivity? Yes. It affects your sleep, it affects your time when you wake up, it affects everything. So, in order to make it to Jannah, you have to be careful about these two desires. The desire for food and drink, and the desire for such relations. You have to put a limit. And then what happens? When a person observes taqwa in these matters, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give him in Jannah whatever that he desires. لا يسمعون فيها لغوان They will not hear in paradise any لغو. Firstly, full enjoyment. And then, on the other hand, nothing that will bother them. So much so that not even a sound that would bother them. لا يسمعون فيها لغوان ولا كذابا Two things they'll never hear in Jannah. What are those two things? Firstly, لغو. And secondly, lying. Notice it hasn't been said that they will not say لغو. And they will not say lies. Because people of Jannah do not lie. People of Jannah do not indulge in uselessness. In the Quran, what do we learn in Surah Al-Baqarah? وَلَهُمْ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ بِمَا كَانُوا يَكْذِبُونَ They will have a painful punishment because they used to lie. Lying leads to hell. And honesty, as difficult as it is, leads to paradise. So the people in Jannah, they don't lie. So if they don't lie, that means they don't even hear any lying. No false statements. لا يسمعون فيها لغوا ولا كذابا Now, what is لغو? لغو, you know about it, but just a reminder because we fall, we slip again and again. We know what لغو is, we know about Surah Al-Mu'minun. قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَاشِعُونَ وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ عَنِ اللَّغْوِ مُعْرِضُونَ But then what is لغو exactly? Yeah, it's in my notes somewhere. Right? What is لغو? Useless talk, noise, loose talk, annoying words. Basically, Imam al-Shafi'i, he said that لغو is that which a person does not intend. Meaning he doesn't mean it. He doesn't actually mean it. Are there things you say when you're angry that you don't actually mean them? Has it ever happened? That you're angry and you say things and you tell the other person later, I didn't actually mean it. That's not what I meant. It just came out because I was angry. Or sometimes we feel so relaxed, we're so chill that we end up saying things which are inappropriate. Hmm? So law is what? Imam al-Shafi'i said, it is that which one does not intend. And he said that all forms of law are wrong. So law, remember it's the sound of birds constantly chirping? Because it annoys. 
after a certain point. It's so loud that it doesn't let you focus on what people are saying to you. So in Jannah there is no lagu, no noise pollution. Nothing annoying that is said, nothing hurtful that is said. So all forms of lagu, remember they are wrong. Whether they are in anger, fighting, arguing, or haste. Because sometimes we say things when we're angry, we don't mean them. When we're arguing, we say things, we don't actually mean them. When we're hasty, we say things, we don't actually mean them. But lahu is lahu. And it has to be avoided. So the successful are those who are not interested in lahu. They don't indulge in it. The Prophet ﷺ, he was not interested in lahu at all. He didn't talk excessively. In a hadith we learn that one salah to the next. If a person avoids lahu in between them, then he will be amongst the illiyun. He will be amongst the illiyun. Who? The one who keeps away from law from when to when? From one salah to the next. And you might think, oh, piece of cake, really? I dare you to try it. And I want you to try it. Force yourself that from lahur to asr, no law. I'm not going to say anything that is useless. I'm not going to indulge in anything that is useless. Which means that if I read something, it's actually beneficial. I'm not just scrolling quickly, quickly, quickly to see what all the messages are. Half read most of them, right? Half read all the tweets, whatever. Half read all the, you know, messages that are there. Just because I have to get an update, you know. I'm so important and these things are so important. I have to know. Really? Avoid lahu. From one salah to the next. Which means that every movement of yours, everything you read and everything you say and everything you do, everything you comment on, is what? Meaningful. Meaningful. Which means that a conversation you're having with your spouse, a conversation you're having with your friend, a conversation you're having with your child, a conversation you're having on the phone, whatever it is, it is meaningful. Even an argument, if you say something, it's meaningful. Meaning it has some benefit of being said. Not just that you're venting. You're just letting out your anger. You're just showing to the other how upset you are with them. No. لا يسمعون فيها لغوان. If we want to make it to Jannah, we have to adopt the character of the people of Jannah. Lahu, remember, it also includes things that are wrong. Meaning saying things which are not correct. This includes backbiting. You know, sometimes we are talking to somebody and they inquire, where is that person? What are they doing? And you say, oh, wasting their life. Is it really necessary to say that? Is it really necessary? This is a lahu statement. Once Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu anhu said that a man was mentioned before the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the people said, and they gave their comment. They said, this man, until he is fed, he doesn't eat. And until he is made to ride, he does not ride. Meaning he won't take initiative to do anything. Even when it comes to eating, you have to tell him. And when it comes to getting onto the camel, you have to tell him. You understand? And if you have to deal with a person who is like this, it gets annoying. So clearly, the people were annoyed with this person. That he doesn't eat until he's fed. And he doesn't ride until he is made to ride. The Prophet ﷺ said, You have done ghiba. You have done ghiba. What is ghiba? Backbiting. They said, we have spoken the truth. It's true. That's exactly how he is. And the Prophet ﷺ said, It is sufficient for a statement to be ghiba that you mention your brother's fault that is in him. Meaning when you see a fault in your brother, in your sister, it's there. But you mention it. That's riba. You did riba. They have a fault, but your mentioning it becomes what? A sin for you. And really, is it necessary for us to talk about the faults of other people? Real or imaginary? Is it really necessary? It's not. And what is it that ruins our relationships or 
ruins, destroys our happiness. What? These kind of conversations. Negativity. لا يسمعون فيها لغوا ولا كذابا Secondly, كذاب. Lying. The Prophet ﷺ did not like lies at all. And in hadith we learned that if someone was caught lying by the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet's attitude would change towards that person. It would completely change. Until the person repented. Lying is a sign of hypocrisy. Even if a person prays or fasts or does hajj or umrah, gives sadaqah, lying is lying. Lahu is lahu and lying is lying. Jannah is free of lahu and it is free of lies. It is free of anything that is annoying, that is hurtful, that is false. Now think about it. What blessings were mentioned of Jannah? Good food and good companionship. And of course a good home also. Now imagine, you are in the most beautiful place You have the most beautiful food. And your family or your friends that you get along with. You're proud of your beautiful children. You're proud of your handsome husband. Right? You're very happy about how he's dressed and how he's looking. And you're just happy about yourself also. Everything is perfect. And then what happens? Somebody at that table lies. Lies. And you know that they're lying. Will you be able to enjoy that meal? Will you? No. Will you be able to enjoy that experience? No. Or if you're eating, and somebody's phone is constantly ringing, constantly buzzing, or there's noise somewhere else, outside or inside, loud music, does that let you enjoy? No. In Jannah, there is nothing that will cause disturbance. Not even a sound. No noise and no hurtful, annoying speech. Assalamu alaikum. There's a nice uh, quote uh, which is, uh, I love it so much. The man came to another man and said, so and so say something about you. So the man replied, they said, he shot the arrow and he missed me, but so why you have to pick up this and stop me on with? Yes. That he shot an arrow at me. It didn't reach me, but you picked it up and struck me with it. This is also lahu, right? He said this and she said that and they did this and they're thinking of that. Honestly, get a life. Really, find something to do and stop talking about other people and stop worrying about who's saying what and who's doing what. Really, get busy in something productive. Value your time. If we want to make it to Jannah, we must be productive, useful people. Not people who are wasting their moments, their lives in lagu and in kithab. لا يسمعون فيها لغوا ولا كذابا جزاء as reward من ربك from your Lord. You see, جزاء is payment. Payment for what? For work. For some effort. جزاء من ربك All of this reward in paradise is what? A reward for what people of taqwa have done. You will get according to what you've done. But this is mir rabbik from your Lord. Because no one can enter Jannah without Allah's permission. Right? A person can bring a whole lot of good deeds on the day of judgment. But if Allah doesn't accept them, that doesn't mean that he will enter Jannah. No. He will only enter Jannah if Allah will accept his deeds, if Allah will be pleased with him. Jaza'an min rabbik. Ata'an. A generous gift. Ata is a gift. And you see, a gift is not taken. It's not taken. You don't go somewhere and say, okay, I'm here to get my gift. No. You don't do that. And if you do that, you better learn not to do that. Right? It's not polite. You don't go on asking people for gifts. And if you ask for a gift, and they give you something, that's not a gift they're giving. They're giving something because they're being pressed to. That's not a gift. A gift is that which is given. Meaning the other gives it to you. Willingly. They want something good for you, which is why they give it. Jannah is what? Ata. 
It's a gift that Allah will give to His servants that He will be happy with. Ata'an Hisaba Ata'an Hisaba Hisaban as in this is made due by Hisab. Made due on account. Meaning after Hisab of their deeds. In other words, they did something because of which they are being given Jannah. And this is why Jannah is of different levels. Isn't it? It's not just one Jannah. It's of different, different levels. And each person will be granted a place in paradise according to his deeds. Ata'an hisaba. This expression also means abundant. Hisaban as in abundant. How? It is said, أَعْطَانِي فَأَحْسَبَنِي Meaning he gave me so abundantly that I said, حَسِبْتْ This is enough for me. You know like somebody is pouring food on your plate? Right? When do you say, enough, thank you? When do you say that? When your plate is full. Isn't it? So, عَطَاءً hisaba Meaning a generous, abundant gift that Allah will give to His servants. And who is Allah? رَبِّ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ The Lord of the skies and the earth. وَمَا بَيْنَهُمَا And whatever that is between them, He is the owner, the master, the creator, the nurturer, the provider, the sustainer of everything. رَبِّ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَمَا بَيْنَهُمَا and who is he? Ar-Rahman, the most merciful. No one is more merciful than him. La yamlikuna. Yet, la yamlikuna, they will not possess minhu from him khitaba, any speech. Khitab is to address someone, to direct one's speech towards someone. So, la yamlikuna, they, as in the creation, on the Day of Judgment, will not have the authority to do khitab to Allah, to address Allah. Meaning in that great gathering, no one will say, I'd like to say something. No one will say to Allah, I have something to tell you. No way. No one will dare. No one will be able to speak before Allah, to argue with Him. No one can do that. In Surah Al-Shura, Ayah 45, Allah says, وَتَرَاهُمْ يُعْرَضُونَ عَلَيْهَا خَاشِعِينَ مِنَ الذُّلْ يَنْظُرُونَ مِنْ طَرْفٍ خَفِي In Surah Taha, Ayah 108, وَخَشَعَتِ الْأَصْوَاتُ لِلرَّحْمَانِ فَلَا تَسْمَعُ إِلَّا هَمْسَا يَوْمَ يَقُومُ الرُّوحُ وَالْمَلَائِكَةُ الصَّفَّا The Day of Judgment is the day when the Spirit and the angels shall stand. How? Safa in rows. Who is Ar-Ruh? Malaika? It's understood, it's the angels. But who is Ar-Ruh? It is the angel Jibreel. Jibreel and the rest of the angels, all of them will stand in rows, in perfect discipline, no chaos. Even people, as we learn, وَعُرِضُوا عَلَى رَبِّكَ صَفَّا لَا يَتَكَلَّمُونَ They will not speak. إِلَّا مَنْ أَذِنَ لَهُ الرَّحْمَانِ Except for the one whom Ar-Rahman permits. The one whom the most merciful allows. That okay, you may speak. And secondly, وَقَالَ صَوَابًا And that individual must also say that which is sawab, that which is correct. What is sawab? That which hits the target. So وَقَالَ صَوَابًا Meaning, he also says that which is correct. So we see in the previous ayah that no one will dare to do khitab to Allah. Meaning no one can initiate any speech. Then how will they speak? Only when Allah allows them. You see sometimes in courts, sometimes in very important gatherings, important places, people start talking. Right? When they're not supposed to talk. And they interrupt the judge. They interrupt people in authority. They create such noise and chaos. Right? Security has to be called in. And that meeting is just stopped right there. Why? Because some people are so rowdy. They start talking. They create such a fuss. They create such a noise. And so the person who has authority loses all their authority. Don't expect this on the Day of Judgment. Because لا يملكون منه خطابا. 
no one can dare to even utter a word. Who will speak that day? لا يتكلمون إلا من أذن له الرحمن Only he will be able to speak who is, firstly, granted permission by Allah. And secondly, that individual must also say that which is correct. وَقَالَ صَوَابَ These are two conditions. This includes even intercession. No one will be able to intercede except by Allah's permission. مَنْ ذَا الَّذِي يَشْفَعُ عِنْدَهُ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِهِ in Surah Taha, Ayah 109, Allah says, يَوْمَئِذٍ لَا تَنْفَعُ الشَّفَاعَةُ إِلَّا مَنْ أَذِنَ لَهُ الرَّحْمَانِ وَالرَّضِيَ لَهُ قَوْلًا No intercession except for who? The one whom Allah permits. And secondly, He approves of His word also. In a hadith in Bukhari, we learn that on the Day of Judgment, people will proceed in groups and they will fall on their knees, and every nation will follow their prophet, and they will say, oh so and so, meaning you are our prophet, intercede for us, do something, say something, talk to Allah. Who will? Which prophet will? Every prophet will refuse, until people will arrive, they will come to who? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa And he will be given permission, to intercede, to speak. ذَلِكَ الْيَوْمُ الْحَقِّ That is the day which is الحق That is true. Look at the description of this day. It is الحق وَالسَّاعَةُ وَالسَّاعَةُ حق. The hour is true. This day is true. The day that these people are asking about in mockery, in disbelief, they doubt it. Allah says it is true. فَمَنْ شَاءَ So whoever wants, اتَّخَذَ إِلَى رَبِّهِ He can take to his Lord مَآبَ A way of return. This day is coming. It's true, it's real. Whether you like it or you don't. Whether you're ready or you don't, it's coming. But whoever wants, they can take a way of return, adopt a way of return to his Lord. What does it mean by this مَآب? مَآب Way of return. Meaning, in what way, in what manner would you like to meet Allah? You are journeying towards Him. إِنَّكَ كَادِحٌ إِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ كَدْحًا فَمُلَاقِيهِ You are going to meet Him. You are in your journey towards your Lord. The question is, how are you going towards Him? What are you taking on this journey? What are you doing to prepare for this most important meeting of your existence? See, it's the most important meeting of your existence. Has it ever happened that all of you are girls over here sitting? Most of you. Many of you are married. Remember the day when you first met your spouse? Or when they were supposed to come see you? Or you were supposed to see them? Were you told to prepare for it? For that meeting? Were you? Or when you think about the time when you will first meet your spouse, it's an important meeting, right? You want to look your very best. Which is why you'll wear the most expensive dress that you can ever own. The most expensive jewelry that you can ever own. The most expensive makeup that you can afford. Isn't it? Why? Just for those few hours when you'll be dressed up like a bride. How much goes into it? Life savings. The girl is born and the mother storing gold for her. She doesn't wear it, but she's kept it in the locker, giving zakat on it every year. My daughter will get married. She likes it, she can wear it. She doesn't like it, I'll sell it and get something she likes to wear. Right? You all understand this, right? How you are told every day, you're going to get married one day, learn to cook. You're going to get married one day, look after yourself, look after your health. You're gaining weight, go exercise. No, don't exercise. You'll get too many muscles. You know, (laughs) seriously. Look after your hair. Why? Because you have to become a bride one day. And girls get irritated. Stop telling me. Leave me. But we don't leave them. And everybody has some piece of advice to give to that young girl. Because one day she has to get married. It matters so much, right? That day is important, no doubt. But the most 
important day of your entire existence is the day that you meet Allah. What are you spending today for that meeting? What are you doing today for that meeting? What are you preparing today for that meeting? فَمَنْ شَاءَ Whoever wants, because it's about wanting it, it's about desiring it. If it's important to you, if it matters to you, then prepare for that meeting. Someone's saying that this life is like those belt like things at airports. It's like where you stand and it's just, it's just like moving. You can choose to stand in one spot, but it'll still keep moving. Or you can choose to move towards it with a purpose. Exactly. You know the escalators that are flat, right? You just stand on them. And what happens? They move. They move. You don't have to walk. So this is how this life is. Even if you do nothing, you're still moving towards your destination. So prepare for your destination. فَمَنْ شَاءَ اتَّخَذَ إِلَىٰ رَبِّهِ مَآبًا إِنَّا أَنذَرُنَاكُمْ Allah says, Indeed we have warned you. And our Lord has spoken the truth when He has said this. Indeed we have warned you. Has Allah warned us? Has He warned us? إِنَّا أَنذَرُنَاكُمْ عَذَابًا قَرِيبًا Of a punishment that is near. The hour is near. Little time is left compared to what has passed since the earth was created. And everything that is on its way is near. عَذَابًا قَرِيبًا Yawma, it is the day when يَنظُرُ الْمَرْءُ When a person will see, he will look at مَا قَدَّمَتْ يَدَا What is it that his hands have put forth? It is the day when a person will see what his hands have put forth. Meaning, what he has done, his deeds. It's the day when your body, your clothing, your house, your resume, it doesn't matter. Your portfolio, it doesn't matter. What matters is your deeds. وَيَقُولُ الْكَافِرِ And the denier will say, يَا لَيْتَنِي Oh, I wish, I wish that كُنْتُ تُرَابَ I wish that I was dust. I wish that I had never been made. Because man is made from mud, right? So he will say, I wish that I had remained mud, never to become a human being. Or, يَا لَيْتَنِي كُنْتُ تُرَابَ Or that I had turned to dust after death and never resurrected. But the fact is that Allah will resurrect everyone, including you and I. He will call us to account. We will see our deeds. We will face our end. We will look at ما قدمت يداه what we have done ourselves. And this day is not far. إِنَّهُمْ يَرَوْنَهُ بَعِيدَا وَنَرَاهُ قَرِيبًا They think it is far, it's actually very near. And Allah is not unfair to His servants because He has أَنذَرْنَاكُمْ He has warned very clearly and very openly. Now the duty, the responsibility is on who? It's on us. What are we going to do? So what is it that matters then? مَا قَدَّمَتْ يَدَا What is it that I am putting forth for myself? Because that is what I will have to see. And its result is what I have to bear for eternity. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa anta. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.